Yeah, have you got everybody? Yeah, fabulous. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our second webinar. Um, the first one was really not quite successful, so we've decided to do another. Um, this one is all about adapting um, your curriculum to um, a specialist setting. Um, I understand that not everybody works in a specialist setting, um, and, and some of you do, um, but that's the way we're going to look at things today. So just a couple of little housekeeping things. There is no need for you to have your camera on if you don't want to, um, and just ask that if you, um, if you are in a kind of busy environment that you pop yourselves on mute just so that we don't get any disturbances during our chat. Um, Throughout our webinar today, if you have any questions that you want to ask um, our guests, Justine and Helen, then um, just feel free to pop them in the chat um, at the bottom. Ali um, is going to be kind of monitoring those and she will collate them all and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can towards the end of our webinar. Um, at the end of our webinar, if you've got any comments that you'd like to make, if there's been any questions that you felt that you could answer, um, feel um, if there is any um, feedback you want to give us, or if you've got any ideas for further webinars, then, then please feel free to send either Ali or myself, Hannah, an email, um, and our email address is uh, ali at dimensionscurriculum.co.uk or hannah at dimensionscurriculum.co.uk. I'll repeat that at the end, so you don't have to scribble it down on a piece of paper right now. Um, little introduction to myself, I am Hannah Homer. I work currently for Dimensions and I also work for a small school in Hong Kong. Uh, Justine is my principal um, and I kind of wear two hats. So I've got the privilege of seeing two sides of the coin, which is really lovely. So I'm going to host today's webinar. Um, I'm going to feed the questions. I am today's chat show host. Um, so I'll be, I'll be uh, facilitating our chat today. Our guests that we've got with us today um, are Helen Redfern. She is assistant head at Heaven Lakes Primary School um, in Heaven in the Northeast. And our other guest with us today is, as I mentioned, Justine Barlow. She is principal of Hong Kong International Learning Academy based in Discovery Bay in Hong Kong. So we have two very different settings, but we do have some similarities, which um, we found out during our conversation pre-webinar. So without much further ado, I am going to get cracking and ask some questions. So um, Helen, um, Let's find out a little bit more about you and your school. Um, how long have you worked at your school? What do you love about your job? And what is your school like? So um, I've been AHT since September 2020, so I'm very new to this role. Um, obviously, been a bit of a learning curve this year. Um, our school has been open since September 2012. We were um, two local schools amalgamated together. I worked at one of the schools as an NQT then came over to this school. Um, so I'm curriculum lead. I love that I can kind of have a real whole school impact on the curriculum, but I'm also still teaching two and a half days a week as well. So I get to see it from the teacher's side. Um, I'm still really involved in the teaching of the curriculum. We are a large primary school. We've got 480 children enrol. On roll, sorry, which comes kind of from nursery right up to year six, and we've also got two specialist provisions, which we're going to go into in a little while. Great, and um, Justine, same for you. Um, just to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about the school and um, what you love about your job, those kind of things. Yeah, we're the total opposite, um, Helen, at her school. We're probably the smallest um, school that you'll probably meet, um, and our highest we've had about fifty-five children on roll. Um, right now, post COVID, we're at 2025 with about 25% um, SEM provision. So, when I'm talking about SEM provision in that um, respect, I'm not talking about kids on the spectrum, you know, um, ASD or ADHD, because we don't class those children as having um, special educational needs. We're very non label, very um, all inclusive. And what I like about my job is I started it 11 years ago with one student, um, and now we're four classrooms, 13 members of staff. I like being in charge. It gives me flexibility. It allows me to meet incredible people, such as yourself, such as the people at Dimensions, and such as everybody else who's on the chat now that I've, I've not met. 
So yeah, that's what I love about my job. Fabulous. So as mentioned at the beginning of our webinar today, the whole conversation is going to be about curriculum and um, adapting curriculum to suit settings that are um, a little bit unusual. So as, you can, as you've already heard, we've got two very um, different schools in terms of size. Um, we've got two di very different schools in terms of the kind of provision that they give, but there's also a lot of similarities as you'll probably hear as we talk for our chat. So um, going on from your role as curriculum lead, Helen, what does your curriculum look like in a broader sense, like across the whole of the school? So kind of English and maths wise, we use um, White Rose for our maths and English, we use text-based literacy approach. So we plan around a text. Um, and then kind of um, foundation subject wise, we've gone for Dimensions, which we launched in October. Um, so we're kind of in our first year of it, which has gone really well. We did try and write our own curriculum. Um, it was really difficult. We tried to put all the skills and the progression in place. It just didn't um, didn't flow, um, and kind of staff and the children really struggled to kind of get enthusiastic about about it. Um, so this has had a massive impact, and we're kind of linking a lot of the text that we use from Dimensions in with our English as well. So it's been a real positive change. Absolutely. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how how did the kind of wider community sort of feel about it? Governors and parents, are they just as enthused as teaching staff? Definitely. I mean, it's been difficult because we haven't been able to have parents in school. Um, kind of, we've launched it. We launched it as a whole school, which we actually had to do remotely, which again, not ideal. Um, but we kind of had a, a launch day where the children dressed up as their, um, their pathfinder and their their character so the parents got really involved with that we share a lot on dojo we send homework menus um whole school overview so the parents know exactly what's going on and the feedback from governors has been really positive we've kind of um, informed them about progression and how things are going they've seen photographs of working books um so yeah all in all it, it's really positive from everyone Fabulous. Justin, I'm going to throw the same question over to you as well. So how does curric what does curriculum look like at HKILA? And um, I mean, we're kind of, we, we're there, we are different because we've always used um, the dimensions curriculum. So we can't really talk about change, but how does it look like? What does it look like in school? Yeah, it's we, we've always had dimensions at the centre of our curriculum because and we've built, if you like, the way we approach um, teaching and learning around that. Um, we use Collins for English and we use Shanghai Maths um, for Maths. Um, and, as, and outside of all of those things, excuse me, I'm so sorry that the phone's ringing. Um, it's just stuck on there. Um, we built it all around because Dimensions is so flexible for us. We teach across all our three um, learning groups from Pathfinders, Navigators, Adventurers. We teach Dimensions at the heart of all that and then supplement it with everything else. We find it very easy, or I find it very easy to adapt, to differentiate it, to make it suit everybody. Um, and certainly for me in the last two years, particularly, when we decided that we were going to go um, full on our specialist arm, our tailored arm, it was the easiest thing in the world to bring it across. Um, having that flexibility, having to be able to use one teacher across all three classrooms because they're familiar with all of those um, themes and learning has been the easiest thing in the world for us. Right. Um, obviously, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but the big kind of um, elephant in the room over the last year has obviously been, a, you know, adapting curriculum to fit a home learning setup that hasn't, it's been very, very new and off the cuff at times. So, We've had a webinar on this previously, but I just want to ask now, Helen, like, what did you, how did you then adapt that very shiny new curriculum to um, a home learning format? Um, what kind of worked well, what didn't? Um, and then how have you kind of adapted it back for people coming back into school? So we did um, use some of the home learning resources from Dimensions. Um, the nature of our children and our families is that some of it would have been too much for them to be able to to manage at home kind of independently so we very much adapted it we took a lot of the text out um and kind of cut it down so that the children could access it we did um 
little videos to go alongside it. So we still carried on um, our themes. Um, so in year three, we did Athens v Sparta, and that was very much done remotely. Um, we couldn't obviously do all of the activities that we would have done in school because resources wise, it's just not available at home. So it was, we did the, the, we made the best of it and we used lots of the resources from you guys, but just adapted them for our, our families. And then when we also had some children in school as well, um, so they did the same things. Um, so then when they all came back, they were all at the same point in their learning and we could then just carry on and move forward. Um, when we came back, we had to put a lot of SEMH provision in, so we kind of put our themes on hold and wrote our own sort of whole school approach based around whole, the planets. And it was very much about feelings and getting back into routine and getting back into school and discussing last, which again, we used the um, dimensions, um, the 3D dimensions PSHE materials for that as well. So that worked really well as a kind of a holistic approach. Are you finding at the moment, um slightly opposite but are you finding that you're having a lot of kids out of school um, with bubbles having to close and open and that kind of thing is it are you is that a situation that you find yourselves in at the moment well, we did really well for a long time um <laughs> and we got everyone back in but in the past kind of couple of weeks yeah we have just started losing bubbles again and, then, and are you having to do some further adaptations to what you're providing or are you kind of it's, it's running okay. It's running okay. Um, we're not so much doing the um, the kind of using the, the dimensions at home materials this time. Okay. I think we've got a bit more confident with the themes and our structure to them. So we're, we're delivering them as we kind of would in the classroom. Um, we're on the essentials units at the minute. So that's kind of making it a little bit easier because mm -hmm. there's just, we're not covering so many um, subjects all in one go. Okay. Um, so that obviously the closure things that have happened in the UK are very different to what has happened in um, Hong Kong. Um, we are on a, obviously a, a very different type of setup over here with how schools stayed open and closed and open and closed. We basically just closed them. We closed what felt like forever. So just seeing how did how did you at HKLA adapt things um, from a classroom format into a home format? It was one of those things. I mean, we went into um, this home format a good four, five, six months before the UK did. And it was one of those things where I think we started off doing YouTube videos. A lot of parents wanted live teaching. We were saying to parents, live classes won't really work because without, especially for the children who don't have the great um, attention span without having somebody in the classroom with them. Because um, a lot of parents here have helpers because they work. So helpers aren't necessarily trained to support the children. So that's one of the things that we are you set up quite early on in that whole um, lockdown. We invited helpers and parents in for workshops and just gave them some basic ideas on how to support your children in numeracy, literacy and the rest of um, the curriculum subjects. We, when we first locked down, we just put everything on Google Classroom and we realised after about five months that we just put way too much on there. And I think what we did in the initial few months was we overwhelmed um, parents with the amount of work that was on there. It's very difficult balancing um, because a lot of parents here want a lot of extra work um, and other parents don't want a lot of extra work. So we just thought if we put it all on the system, then um, everybody can pick and choose. Um, for the children who can't access, especially those children with the more profound um, special educational needs, what we did then was we focused more on our hands-on. We have um, two programmes developed, a hands-up programme developing the fine and gross motor skills and a speak-up um, programme that supplements the work that our occupational and speech therapists um, do during the regular classes. And with that, we actually put all the resources together. It was kind of like an Amazon packing room. We collected everything and then sent it all out by post. And then what we did, we had the teacher teach the live lesson. So whether it was um, an auntie or a helper or a brother or a sister, we had them doing all of that. The second time round, we were a whole lot uh, because we opened up, we thought by the time we got to August last year, that things would be back to normal and we wouldn't have to worry about any of this. And of course, then within two weeks, we were shut down again. Um, so this time we just focused on um, 
English, Math, Science, and at one theme. And we brought the children together once a week. We did live lessons then, but we did one-to-one -one for the children who don't have, um, who needed that bit more support. And it was a whole lot easier by then. And even coming back into the classroom now, we've taken some of those elements of the Zoom lessons, the YouTube lessons, and we actually still use those in class. So for example, we've got three classrooms here. Um, we use um, the creative curriculum, plus like I said, uh, Collins English and Shanghai Maths. So sometimes we have one teacher, they will zoom in in one classroom and give the input. So it's actually now we've, we've found it saves us um, staffing as well, because we've just got one person delivering the same lesson across the board. And in those separate classrooms where you've got children whose, whose maybe behavior is a bit more disruptive, they can manage that behavior away from the other children without distracting them while still giving the children who are um, have those difficulties the same access to the curriculum so we become much more effective at inclusion rather than segregation for inclusion we're now incorporating everybody under the, the one roof so it's been it's been as hard as it's been i think it's been one of the better things that's happened actually in terms of having us all really examine what we do and how we do it and what we should keep and, and what we should be doing. So for yeah. us, it's been, um, I think it's been positive, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think that, you know, the way that kind of things, uh, the schools work over here, especially with international schools, is we're not beholden to any kind of Ofsted or mm. um, regulatory body in that sense. So I think what we've been able to do, um, and I'm sure you'll agree with me here, Justine, is we've been able to kind of go, right, what was working and what wasn't working and kind of cleaned things up a little bit in terms of how what how the curriculum is, has been delivered. You know, we've probably found that some things in there that were very superfluous and weren't really yeah. benefiting anybody. And now having to sort of really like scale things back a little bit has made, has found space for better things to happen or for, you know, just for a, clean, a cleaner curriculum in a way. It's just, um, I think people are getting a lot more out of it. The kids are more focused and the staff are more um, more engaged with it because they're not thinking of so many other things. Yeah, definitely. I think what it's what it's allowed us to do, Han, is um, streamline. It's, it's, it's allowed us to streamline everything whilst actually making our provision much more effective. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's worked out really well. And I think every one of us has become, um, I don't know, if you use like a sporting analogy, we've all become utility players. You know, we're not just the A's now or teaching assistants or teachers or head teachers or specialist support teachers. We all, like yourself, wear two, three, four, five hats. And that means we can streamline and be much more effective. Yeah. Um, we're going to just um, just to welcome those people who joined us a little later. Um, you won't have heard my initial um, input. If you've got any questions that you want us to answer, uh, well, Justine or Helen to answer at the end of our webinar today. Um, feel free to pop them in the chat. Ali, um, my colleague at the Mind Dimensions, is going to be um, keeping an eye on that. So feel free to just throw anything out there that you you fancy um, asking. And then if you've got any feedback or if you've got question, a question comes up that you feel you could probably answer better, then feel free to um, bother us an email and I'll give emails out at the end of the session. Um, so Helen, we're going to kind of move into the kind of SEN side of things because obviously both yourself and Justine have um, as a specialist um, arm to your schools that, um, that work with children with um, SEM uh, D um, issues. So just thinking on the home learning side of things for a second, obviously adapting it for a whole school is, um, adapting curriculum for a whole school is kind of, you know, you have to do it very broadly. So what did you do that meant that you could adapt it for your children in your special needs um, provision department? So um, I'll just explain kind of how our provision works. Yeah. So kind of on our whole school, um, we've got 133 children, so 28% of our um, school are on the SEND register. But part of that, we have two specialist um, resource bases, which are SEMH focused, and we take children from out of borough. Um, and the idea is they come in for ideally no more than two years, um, and then they are integrated back into mainstream, either quite often it's within with our school, or they go back to their home school, if you like. If at the end of two years, it's not appropriate for them to go back, 
um, than alternative provisions found for them. Um, it's very SEMH focused, but we have ended up with quite a lot of children with um, ASD, and that's kind of currently the, the nature of the children we've got in there at the minute. We have a key stage one resource base where we've currently got five children. They are all boys. So obviously kind of thinking curriculum wise, the teachers are very good at sort of adapting to the interests of them. And then in our key stage two resource base, we've got seven children, five boys and two girls. Um, they were all actually in school during lockdown because um, we had to open for vulnerable children. They have all got EHCP plans, so they are classed as um, vulnerable. So they were all in school. They were in school and their curriculum continued, um, but actually they found it tricky now that they've come back and normality has sort of started again for them. Um, also, a lot of them are about to transition. Some are going off to different provisions. Some are um, leaving because it's end of year six. So we've had to really think about what we do for them um, because they've struggled going back into their normal curriculum. Yeah. So um, pre 2020, mm -hmm. um, and obviously you you brought in a new curriculum. So how have you um, adapted your curriculum for those children in those um, those little pods, as it were? What's had to what's had to change from the mainstream? Um, so they are kind of, they do have constraints with time. Um, they do their English and their maths kind of following the national curriculum. The hardest thing is the, um, the range of children within there. So yes, in Key Stage 2, they might be children aged from kind of year three to year six, but actually their learning needs are, are vast. Um, so what kind of happens is the teacher in there chooses um, an adventurous theme. So she goes for kind of year three, year four and rotates them on a rolling programme because the children are there for two years so they're not having the same experiences. Um, they do lots of theraplay um, and kind of extra SEMH drawing and talking so they need to plan in time for that. So what the teacher does is she just picks out the bits of the theme that she thinks is going to engage the children the most. Um, we'll try and link her English through it as well. Um, and then when she plans the next theme, ensures that she's not missing out the same subjects each time. So it has, that's, sorry, that's our phone. Um, it has, it does really engage them. Um, you can really see the amount of work they've produced, works really, really has um, had a massive impact on them. You know, they come to, with us for whole school assemblies, they see themselves as adventurers, just like the rest of the school, the key stage one see themselves, you know, as explorers and pathfinders. They don't see themselves as being separate because they're doing what we do. Okay, yeah. Um, that's, I think that's amazing that you, you know, there's no kind of, you know, separation. There's the, you, your teachers are obviously working really hard to keep as much of that yeah. core as curriculum as possible. Um, and obviously, like you mentioned, obviously they've got things that they need to have as part of a special, a special needs curriculum, but the, the key aspects are still there that aren't separate, separate from the rest of the school. You know, there's that, you know, adaptation that is trying to keep it as, as core as possible. Um, so Justine, if you want, obviously you've mentioned the tailored program um, mm. and sort of hands up and speak up. So how else has the curriculum been adapted for, um, for those stu students in the tailored department and maybe give us a little bit more of an insight into what tailored is yeah. in the whole yeah. school. Um, we work very much on stage, not age here. And I guess we've always been the, the, the place where, because schooling here is quite competitive. So you've got really big juggernauts of private education. You've got the English Schools Foundation and they've all got these most amazing buildings which are huge and vast and fantastic if you are a typical developing student uh, and if you're going to, to reach a certain level of academia or education level by the time you get to you know, year 11 and 12. We're not that. Um, and we found now that having had lots of people come to us and do really well with us, we wanted to do more. We were having enrollment forms and inquiries piling up with lots of children who wanted to come to us but couldn't come to us because we had to make sure that what we were giving them was quality. It's all very well opening the doors and saying, yes, we can do this and yes, we can do that. But then you've got to do it. 
and with the best will in the world, it takes time, it takes effort. And you've really got to look at how you um, operate your curriculum. And so this year particularly, just before we went to lockdown, we made the decision that we would open a separate arm of um, um, HPLA that would deal with children who had specific and severe or more, more severe learning difficulties than the other children. But that then posed as a problem because we're, we're not one size fits all, we're, 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 everybody's welcome here. So we were stuck with, well, how are we going to make it um, the same for everybody and inclusive without excluding those tailored people? Because if you're inclusive, how can you have two separate arms? So we really then had to look about how we become more effective. And the way you become more effective is, is through your curriculum. Certainly for us, it was uh, the easiest thing in the world to put the curriculum at the center of all of that and say, right, okay, we're gonna stick with the themes across all three of our Pathfinders, Navigators, Adventurers. Then we're going to supplement that learning with either the English and Maths that we do in the rest of the um, school, the Shanghai Maths or the Collins, and where they weren't able to access that at that level. And a lot of them are absolutely able to, to complete this work. They're just not able to, to focus long enough and are distracted in a bigger classroom um, scenario to do it independently. So then we started supplementing that with a plus one maths program, which is very much um, aimed at children with dyscalculia and those children who have problems with focus in that you're just working on the basic number skills um, and just doing it repetitively both like you would a phonics or a synthetic phonics system. And then for the children who have come in who have ADSD or ADHD or dyslexia, we've also worked at doing the Alton Gillingham. So we've, we've worked on upscaling the, the talents of our staff and making sure that all our EAs now are either Alton Gillingham trained or plus one trained. And then on top of that, you've got, um, we have faith in our staff members and we give them the power to develop their own programs, like um, Hands Up and Speak Up. We have a member of staff who is a specialist teaching assistant who has made it her role to speak with occupational therapists, speech therapists, and work with them to develop a program that sits within the dimension themes, but also supports the learning of those children as well. And that means that you can bring children from the other classrooms in because everybody can benefit, certainly at um, year one level on developing fine and gross motor skills. So those children, pretty much like Helen said, feel they are a part of something very much at the center of the whole of the curriculum and not just um, an add-on at the end of it. So we were very, very lucky that when we got the premises and we knew we could move quickly, we already had the curriculum in place and it just meant then just rolling it out across. And it's been, what we know, April, May, June. It, it, it's been the best part of an academic year, but already we've, we've made a firm foundation for building on even further, starting in August, because we finished now for this academic year. We're on yeah. school break now. So we'll start again in August, hopefully. But yeah. again, it, it, it's making sure that we keep that curriculum and those staff specialisms up to date. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's almost become a little bit of a celebrity status to be <laughs> yeah. yeah. in our other students. Yeah. <laughs> How do we get in there? What do we have to do? <laughs> yeah. Not realize uh, desperately, yeah. Why are they there? We want to yeah. be in that yeah. group. What do Not I need realizing to that that the work yeah. they're doing is all kind of the same. They just happen yeah, to be it's exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they um I think they're that that really shows a kind of a similarity to very two very different school settings in that that continuity of core things no matter what adapts around it what changes have to happen to accommodate needs and um, difficulties and disabilities and things that are, are not work that you would say are not working for kids academically those core things are so important and um, mm. so a quality curriculum and keeping those kind of key aspects going. Um, I'm just going to mention here that um, Helen you've started using the Get Ahead um, program. Yeah. I, I don't think we chatted much about this We've been in our sort of pre-chat. Um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about how yeah. that works? Yeah I think one of the things just to say as well just on the back of what you, you've just been talking about is that I think what's really good about the dimensions and the themes is that they're not all writing based mm. so actually they are accessible for all of the children. So even our, you know, our mainstream children who ascend 
can access it. And even if it's just about adapting the amount of text that's there for them, or I know in the resource bases, they find the group work activities really quite challenging due to the nature of their behaviors. The teacher adapts them so that they're more individual tasks or she'll do the research part for the children. So then they have it there and they can access it to then do the follow on task. So it is completely manageable. And, you know, it, it isn't just a purely writing focused curriculum, um, which I think that's why it's worked. But yeah, the get ahead. So we actually um, have ended up trialing that because our, um, especially our key stage two based children, I was saying that they were struggling really with the thought of transition and kind of they'd been in school the whole way through, but then everyone else was back and trying to get back into normality. They, they found really challenging. Um, and Elaine mentioned about Get Ahead and the, it, the idea is that it's very kind of focuses on again core skills for them and to get them ready for sort of 21st century living and being able to adapt um, and they, they've done it for probably half term they've absolutely loved it um, they've kind of they've looked at little challenges like creating an obstacle course. So they're looking at their resilience and overcoming obstacles and how that works in life. They've done biscuit dunking, you know, where they've kind of tested out different biscuits and they've thought about, and then cutting up pictures to stick them back and put them together. And can they overcome things where it's more challenging? So it's just kind of, again, it's all following our SEMH provision. But what we've decided, because that has actually worked so well, is we're going to roll it out across the whole school from September. Um, so we did just have a staff meeting on Monday and we're gonna build it into our golden time because currently golden time is the children just choose what they want to do. So we're gonna have it on a, a rolling program every three weeks. And on one of those weeks, they do one of the challenges from the Get Ahead program and they're gonna work towards awards. So key stage one, we've called them bronze awards, key stage two, lower key stage two, silver, upper key stage two gold and they work um, and they end up doing 10 challenges across each of their year groups so again it's just to kind of build in the resilience the problem solving you know develop their curiosity all of those life skills which the, our children really need to be able to kind of work within the academic curriculum as well so we're all quite looking forward to that and you know even some of it is just sort of um, throwing a ball in a hoop or you know screwing up paper how many can you get in a hoop in a certain amount of time but they have to decide how they're going to um, set the challenge up how they're going to plan it how they're going to work in a team so it's all of those skills hoping they'll develop without them realizing that they're necessarily mm -hmm. doing it and it's all in a fun way rather mm -hmm. than sitting down and feeling like right we're working yeah. um so yeah hopefully that's going to work really well fantastic and it's nice to see that you're you know, again, adapting something to mm. to kind of fit your setting and how it how it works for it, and and tweaking it for the different key stages and yeah. for your special needs pods and that kind of thing. So yeah. everyone is getting that umbrella, but it's it's nice that it's been able to be yeah. Because the challenge is kind of initially set as sort of the key stage one, um, key stage two. We didn't want our key stage two base children to know they were doing key stage one challenges, yeah. um, which is why we kind of chatted with Elaine and said, look, can we adapt the names of these, mm. um, which has been done for us just so that they don't like to think that they're not doing something that's relevant to their age, which anyone's the same, aren't they? Um, yeah. You know, and actually they are completely transferable, the challenges anyway. So you could use some of the, the bronze challenges up in key stage two, you know, and, and just, you just get more out of it. Um, but yeah, it has its work really well. Yeah. Oh, that's really nice to hear. Um, I'm in terms of talking about awards and qualifications and things. Um, we had a question, um, coming pre webinar, um, that I'm just going to put out to, um, Justine in particular, cause we've had a discussion about this pre this and Helen felt that she didn't quite have, um, the ex experience on this and feel free if there's anybody else who thinks they could, um, answer this question better, pop that your comments in the chat or you can email us later. Um, it was a question regarding a student in secondary, um, and obviously we are looking mainly at primary here, but, um, HKILA has, uh, has and does have, um, children who are technically secondary students um, and this was for a secondary student who is currently working at a year five level and the sort of what could be put in place 
for um, a pathway to gaining some qualifications or awards um, as they move through. Um, the issue you've probably got in the UK more there is that children do have to leave school at, at a certain age. So they, you know, they, once they come to the end of secondary, they are going to have to go on to further education. Whereas the children we've had at our school, we're happy to have them for as long as we feel that we're still giving them the best that we can. Um, so I'm going to throw that question out to Justine, just to kind of give the, the um, give the person answering that question some things that, that you've done at HRLA for older students working at um, a less, a lower um, academic age. Sure, we've, um, we haven't had anybody who's in secondary school working at an age, a five-year-old age, um, certainly not at this stage we don't, but what we've done before is we've had, we've had children come to us who were maybe um, 13, 14 and working at year one level and with global developmental delay. So they've stayed with us through the years one, two, three, four, five, six, because certainly with the global development delay that this child had, she progressed year on year on year, just a good four or five years behind. And I think the hardest thing for us was managing the expectations of the parents first and foremost, because not everybody will reach a certain level of um, academic um, gain or, or or whatever so then we looked at um using asdan um through the uk so they're vocationally based um qualifications and we did that quite successfully where the children just get accredited for doing certain units so whilst it's not necessarily an equivalent of a gcse or it uh, would get you into university it would certainly give you something that you could then go on to use um further on we've also with this particular student um ended up working one-to-one -one with her through Oxford Learning Online in the UK. And she dropped all the other curriculum subjects and just focused on history and English. And so we made sure that um, during the day she came into school, our teachers worked one-to-one. -one. Bear in mind, we were a lot smaller. We have that luxury of doing that, if you like. But she was able to manage to walk away with two A stars in uh, qualifications just below GCSE level. One of the things that I was very conscious starting HKLA was that we have to provide a pathway, even if we don't know what it is yet, we have to provide a pathway for those children who want to stay with us after year seven, eight, nine. And right now, going into August this year, we've had a student who's 17 um, and is academically able to achieve, but doesn't have the focus with ADHD. So we've worked less on the academics, just focusing on, on English and maths, and had them working in our tailored um, school section and teaching from um, yeah, almost like an EA training session. And over the summer, they've been doing some of the work placements, or they will with our high, and going next year that whilst they're still doing student hours, they won't do the curriculum. They will come full time and work, and we're writing and designing an education program that's going to be vocationally um good for them and learning some skills at the same time so we're constantly changing all of those things the hardest thing sometimes is, is to manage the expectations of parents because some parents think if the child is making progress with you that great they're fixed so we can now put them back here and my answer is always well they're not broken in the first place it's we just have to make sure that we've got the right curriculum and the right um the tools and skills for them so everything is ongoing and we're already looking at bringing in more programs a year from there for the children who will also end up there. So, yeah, but there are lots of different routes through. I think equals, I work with their curriculum um, two or three years ago. Um, and yeah, as Dan and one to one. But after this whole um, pandemic, there are so many more um, options that are available for children who can't necessarily function in a mainstream school, but have the ability um, to succeed nonetheless. Yeah, I think that was, you know, particularly with um, the our student who took, who took those qualifications, it was also managing her expectations as well. Sure. I, yeah. I mean, she was, for her, she, like you were saying, she progressed, she made progress year on year, but it was all, it was, you know, it would, it was a couple of years behind and then she got into a bit of momentum so we kind of caught her up to her academic age and her chronological yeah. age in a way um 
the joy of you know small school one to one a lot of the time with her building up those and it was also building confidence. I think that's the lovely thing about the ASDAM is that yeah. you know you it, it's practical skills and mm. it builds self esteem. Um, I, mean, I think we have found a lot of our students they're academically able. Um, such as our student who's going to go and work in our tailor department, but a lot of the time it's her self-esteem that holds her back. Mm. Um, and having that confidence in herself that she can do these things. So I think those kind of being able to adapt and find new things. And like you say, after everything that's happened in the last year, there's so many more now that are um, out there that are a good quality um, provision for students who need just that extra or that bridging um, qualification or award that lets them build up so yeah i think that they would be some really good ones as down equals um oxford learning um so i hope that answers the question about the uh about that lovely student i hope you can help them out um i'm gonna just we've talked a lot about time constraints and the issue the stresses that puts on the curriculum time time in the classroom in terms of children having occupational therapy or having to go out to speech therapy and that kind of thing Helen, do you have those kind of things, provisions on site, or do you find that, is there access to that for your students, or do they do it outside of school hours? How does that kind of work with your um, SEND students? We do have specialist provision that come into school. Um, for our particular children in the resource bases, it tends to be um, out of curriculum time if possible, and a lot of it's done in-house as well by the, the staff that are in the resource bases. So the kind of the TheraPlay, um, the SMH, other kind of um, sort of programs that they follow, the drawing and talking that they use. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't turn, it's more, they have a, a slightly shorter day. So they've right. got more to try and pack in. Um, and obviously time constraints can happen because of their behavior. So actually, you know, it might just be the low, it might be the behavior of one child but that can impact the rest. It can take the teacher out because they might, if it's a big behavior, the teacher has to get involved. Um, so again, they're just having to constantly adapt sort of and go with, go with the flow a little bit really um, and try and best to kind of build it so it, it's gonna work for their children in their, in their provision. Yeah, um, I think the similar thing with, we've got students who have OT and speech therapy, it's that balancing act, isn't it just seen a of yeah. making sure that they get those um, provisions but also get the rest of their curriculum time yeah yeah but we've what we did with ours is we we kind of simplified the curriculum they have the same access to english and maths and the thematic curriculum as well but we simplified it and they come in nine till one so we have aba therapists working there so they get lots of one-to-one -one, and then they also get their thematic learning plus the english and math so um, and those children who are able then to develop the focus past one o'clock in the afternoon, certainly fingers crossed if we can go back to full day schooling, because in Hong Kong, we're still not allowed to do full day schooling. Kids are only allowed in um, half a day at the moment uh, and they can't have um, lunch or snack or anything else like that here. Um, but we're hoping that for those children who've done so well this year in Thailand, that post one o'clock, they will then join the rest of the children for more of their fun work. This is what, like going back to what Helen was saying, one thing that children don't need more of this year is more work. They need more engagement. They need more, to vote, more, more, more motivation, more fun. Uh, and so do the teachers. I mean, I take my hat off to all of the staff here and in the UK who are going to work every day with a smile on their faces and trying to make the whole thing work because it's been the hardest thing ever. And I think you can have learning and you can have fun and, and if kids are happy, then learning comes naturally anyway, right? So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, I'm getting conscious that we are coming up to the 45 minute mark um, and I'd like to be able to offer people the opportunity to throw some questions into the chat box so if you wish to. Um, so this is going to be my kind of last question to you, ladies, is um, what is the best thing that you have seen from your current curriculum with your SEN provision? And then also what has been the best thing you've seen from your curriculum in your mainstream progression? Helen. So I think it's just the enthusiasm. I think um, that's kind of really shone through from all of the children, the buzz about it, the chat around it. Um, 
you know, we've done themes that we never thought we would, uh, you know, concepts we never thought we'd address. We did slavery in year three and I teach year three and I thought, oh my goodness, how are we going to do this? They loved it and they just, they just went with it. Um, and I think the kind of the same in, in the bases, I went and chatted to the teacher and said, right, if there's one thing you could say that has really stood out or one theme that's really worked and she said, I can't. She said, I'm not just saying it to say it. She said, I genuinely can't because the way of doing it has worked for these children. It's something different um, that they've all been able to engage with. I saw the work that they did um, in Come Fly With Me Africa and I thought it was brilliant and the masks that they made, you know, even the writing that they were producing um, and the quality of the work. But she's kind of said, no, across the board, they've they've just gone for it and they've loved it. And again, in Key Stage 1, you know, the, the resource-based teacher there, he just said, it's really worked for them. It's just been, you know, he adapts it to make it a little bit more computer-based for some of them, but they've loved it. It's really worked. Good. Justine? Yeah, they're all good. I think for the, the one that sticks out for me was that for all folks. And the, when we had the culmination and the Oscar ceremony and all the children who were... were in that group who've done it as a theme came in they wore their best oscar gowns they were interviewed you know um post award ceremony and afterwards and that was that we were then able to open it up to the whole school now our yeah. whole school isn't isn't big but it meant that our other students in other classrooms could join and they became viewers in that ceremony a little bit like you would do in the real oscars that we sit at home and do it they got to vote for their favorite film and everything else and they had their popcorn while they were doing it it was just one of those things that just brings everything together. And it's absolutely what Helen was saying. It's that engagement. Uh, we had the You're Not Invited, where we were going to go to what a beach just out of the just out of our um, classrooms here. We were going to go and have a Nerf gun war or a water fight. And in the end, they just had they made their own shields. And it was just it's just so nice to see people engage because it's been the hardest thing to engage children. We have to wear masks all day, every day. The students are sat all facing forwards with a perspex screen between them. It is the most unnatural teaching environment you will ever have to, to teach in. And yet they've still managed to maintain motivation. And we've been able to do that because we have such an exciting curriculum. We've got yeah. such great staff who are invested in it, know the curriculum inside out. We already know what we're teaching for next year. I can't wait to introduce some of the new themes that we're going to do next year. So yeah, it's been that, it's been fun uh, and motivating, yeah. I think what we can, um, well for me, take, take away from today is, yes, it started out as a chat against about adapting your curriculum, but I really, it's had to be an, ad, an adaptation of school, especially this year, to then facilitate the adaptation of that curriculum. And um, mm. I think, obviously, we're just speaking to you two lovely ladies at your, in your schools, but I think, what we what we can hear is that it's happened really really well and the kids are happy and the staff are happy and i think having that being able to adapt and easily adapt um is a credit to both schools um which i think is fantastic um if anybody has any questions we do have some time left if anybody wants to anything out there ali has there been any questions um put forward um, no, not not for us to discuss in in the chat. But um, oh, we've just had one now. Just one now. <laughs> can you see that, or would you like me to read it out? I don't mind reading it out. I don't I want to read the beginning. Chat, I don't want to <laughs> um, okay, so it says um, we have been using Hamilton for our English curriculum, and I don't find it engaging enough. Can anyone recommend an English curriculum that complements Learning Means the World from Dimensions? Helen, do you want to yeah, tell me? yeah. I was yeah about how you use English to link with your LMTW. Yeah, so we use text-based curriculum, text-based literacy. Um, so the idea is we take one text um, and it usually, it might last kind of three weeks, four weeks, depends on the, on the text. Sometimes it's a picture book, sometimes it's a, um, a novel type book. Um, we use picture books right across the school. And the idea is that we then use the skills for that year group um, and the national curriculum skills and we build all our writing and all our reading around one text um, and obviously when you look at the um, dimensions themes it does mention certain texts that you could use so for example in year three for under the canopy we've used the great k-pop tree for our english so we got all of our um, persuasive writing from it um, 
you know, they, they kind of wrote about saving the rainforest. So it all fit, you know, it fits brilliantly. Um, we're currently, uh, we're doing out and about. So we are, um, we've gone for journey by Aaron Becker. So we've, we've kind of used journey and it's a picture book. Um, and we've watched the video of it and the children are then writing their, their sequels to it of where the characters go next. So because text-based literacy was quite embedded in school, we, we found that quite easy to take some of the text, the upper, upper key stage two use journey to the frozen north um, as part of, they linked that in with their America theme. So it hasn't been difficult for us to do because it's something that we were used to doing. We've just used different texts to do it um, and amend it that way. Yeah, right. so it does work quite easily. Right, we did the same. That. Yeah, go on Justine. Go yeah, we did the same, we've done the same through. We, we did Wonder, we've done uh, The Thieves of Ostia and it's always been very easy once you get the theme to tie in, especially, you know, the, the, the books and the text-based literature, um, it's very easy to do, yeah. yeah. And there is planning about, sorry, that, you know, if you, if you think, oh, I want to go for a, te a certain text and I'm not sure how to do the text-based literacy and the sequencing of your lessons, there's plenty of examples out there, which is kind of what we use when we got started. Um, if you just Google it and then once you've done it once or twice, you get a text and you know exactly where you're going with it and the types of things you can do and include because it tends to follow the same structure. It works for our children. It's brilliant for building vocabulary and language which is is what we really needed to focus focus on in our school yeah and like we supplemented at hkla with the collins treasure house as well for yeah. that kind of the um so the, the sort of the bare bones stuff the spelling the grammar punctuation that kind of thing um yeah um i think using using the theme as a guide is is a really good place mm. to start for that um ali have we got any others yes we've got thank you so much you're welcome. <laughs> um, okay, so how is the content or tasks from Dimensions adapted for those pupils who are working on a curriculum below their year group? Justine, I think you'd be a good person to answer this, seeing as we are stage. stage yeah, we, we, again, I think it's like goes back to what Helen was saying. If they're, if they're working below their year group, we do tend to focus more on the creative um, side of it. You can access through the themes. Um, you can you can show how the children of of they, uh, they demonstrate their learning just at the simpler hands-on you know they might they might make something they might paint something they might do um some role play um and it becomes really easy to do and what we've done before as well we've got pathfinders navigators and adventurers now um if we find that even the youngest of the themes is is, is still too high we've then gone back to the original dimensions um, um themes so we go moving into the early years and that works quite well. In fact, that's what we've planned already for August, that we'll have three themes. But if we think we're stretching our children in our tailored section too much, we've got another one that we can just slot straight in. And that's the beauty of um, having been with Dimensions for 11 years now. There's always something that you can do either up or down. Yeah. We, um, I find it, so the children, at, at, they're taught the themes for their relevant year group um kind of the children who are in the mainstream classes and as a class teacher i found that actually the, the content is accessible they mm. may just kind of it it's their outcome that might be different you know we you partner them up with the more able all the things that you would do normally in your classroom setting you might different differentiate the you know the the reading that they're given you might break it down for them but they've all accessed it and they've all learnt and actually the real kind of send children in my mainstream class have surprised me when we've done about under the canopy and learning about the plants and the names of the plants and the role of them and the actual rainforest and the structure of it they're the ones who can tell you and they're the ones who've really shone in this as well because they don't have to write everything down and a lot of it's it's talked about or like you say they've drawn it to show what what they understand and what they know um so i would yeah i i, I kind of think it's as you would do in your normal class for your english and your maths and you differentiate but it is really quite easy to do um and i i learned not to underestimate my children when it came to some of these themes i really did 
That's, ex that's exactly right. It's making it so that uh, everything's accessible. I think if we start saying that, you know, we lower expectations because of what you see children do generally, I think you are doing those children a disservice. Yeah. Um, because how do you know how far they can go unless you pitch it at that level first? And that's always the number one um, focus for us. We pitch it at that level and work from there. And you're right, yeah. it's those children who you don't necessarily expect to come out with the big questions and mm -hmm. the, everything as well. And that, that's brilliant when you get that. Mm. Yeah. Definitely. Ali, anything further? We'll take one more question. Um, yep. And then we'll the final question. Um, how many, oh, we've had two actually. How many hours per week are the different schools spending on Dimensions Creative Curriculum? Helen, do you want to jump in yeah. there? Yeah, so we do um, every afternoon. Um, we also fit in our, we do a jigsaw for our, um, PSHE because that was established and worked really well. Um, so we have to have time for PE and time for jigsaw. The rest of the time is for learning music world themes. So you say uh, two to three afternoons a week probably? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we kind of fit in our little basic skill sessions and things around it. Um, and we do our themes over over six weeks. So we plot out, we plot out basically 24 sessions. Yeah, okay. Just we're similar with our um, regular classes and for the children who are in tailored this term it's usually about an hour a day because we find that it takes them that bit longer um, to access everything that's there um, because they're in, they're in shorter hours, they, they finish at one. So we spread it out over a week. Yeah. And final one? Just um, yeah, so final question. Um, as an SEN school, we find sometimes that we rush to finish themes. How long do you allocate for each theme? Also, you mentioned NC essential, Essentials. How do you incorporate these? Okay. Justine? Uh, oh, no, go oh, on. I'll go just first because she just was chatting, finished off the chat, so go on. How, um, what, what do, what's happening at HPLA in terms of time frame? We're very lucky here, and um, like Hannah said, we're not at um, we're not monitored by Ofsted, but we are monitored by the Education Bureau. So we still have to do things. Um, we still have to make sure that the quality of education we give it is is quality. We don't rush through. Um, if if we want to take seven weeks to do a theme and it's going well and, and children are liking it, we'll take seven weeks. Sometimes we do it in less of that because we will just get it through it a lot quicker, or it doesn't lend itself. Some particular themes might be more heavily science-based or um, more history-based. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of flexibility in how and how long we spend on those yeah. things, we're very lucky. But we tend to, in general, we tend to follow the uh, six week, five week, however long the themes are. And in our term as well, we have some where we've only got two weeks. So we're just going to do some of the standalone um, concept units next year as well. Yeah, competency, yeah, because obviously they're short. Yeah. So, yeah, we have a really funny term that's Christmas to Chinese New Year, and sometimes it can be a maximum of four weeks, a minimum of two. So it's it gets a bit tight around that time. Um, Helen, do you want to just come in on the NC Essentials? Um, you said you're using it. So how are yeah. you fixing that in? So our themes are based that we have six weeks, um, and it was quite a different way of thinking because I don't know what everyone else is like, but we were used to going, right, we're doing a topic for a half term. And it's like, it fits it fitted in between the holidays. We've kind of, we don't do that now. So if it goes over a holiday, then so be it. We yeah. planned that um, each of our four big themes was six weeks long. And then we do our, we allocate three weeks for either the competency units or the NC Essentials units. Um, what we used to do is we would have um, like a book week and a science week and you know all of these other things which they were lovely to do but actually took away from what we needed to be doing so we ended up not covering what we needed to cover so by kind of slimming down those and just kind of really focusing on what we need to be teaching we found it's worked and we're obviously in our first year um, so we did find actually our theme three, our conservation um, theme, it's been really quite meaty um, and particularly for our year group, the science was big. So we found actually we needed seven weeks mm -hmm. um, and next year when we're plotting out the, the curriculum and the time we need, we're going to give that theme seven weeks. Um, 
And then the essentials ones, we don't have a problem fitting those into the three weeks. That works really well because they're really tight, they're really focused. I think it's just if you've got practical elements and then you want to do kind of make sure you're doing your scientific, scientific inquiry, you do need to give a little bit longer than you kind of anticipate. Yeah. But we know that for next year. Yeah, that's the thing. It's a learning curve, isn't it? Yeah, You've got to absolutely. Things that worked this year and things that didn't. Yeah, definitely. Well, I'm going to bring it to a close there. It is Bob on um, the hour. So um, if you've got any further questions um, that you want to ask, we can, I can pass things on to Justine and to, and to Helen. Um, please send us an email um, either to Ali or myself. Really easy to remember. We're Ali at dimensionscurriculum.co.uk or Hannah at dimensionscurriculum.co.uk. We're happy to welcome feedback from you. If you've got any suggestions for further webinars that you think would be an interesting topic, something that maybe your school, um, you'd like to discuss about your school and the area that you're in would be great. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ali just popped them in the chat there. So if you want to just click on the chat, you can see our email addresses there. Thank you so much for um, taking the time to be with us today. Thank you very much, Justine and Helen for um, your insight. Thank you. It's been great to chat with you. Um, and we hope to see you again on our next webinar. So keep an eye out for um, our various posts on various social media platforms. Um, but thank you very much. And we will see you again. Thank you so much, Thanks, everybody. everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.